So I'm going to tell you tonight a story about microbes and the potential of using microbes in the future of precision medicine. Microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi, tiny, primitive, prehistoric, microscopic life forms that cohabitate our planet. When we think of microbes, most of us often think of pathogens, and I suppose this is fair. Pathogens, or microbes that cause disease, have killed more people in the history of our planet than anything else. The numbers are actually quite staggering. Smallpox, for example, has wiped out swaths of humanity over time, by some estimates as many as 500 million people in the 20th century alone. The Spanish flu of 1918 killed four times as many people as the Great War itself. And other microbes like typhus and cholera, HIV, Ebola, rabies, polio, to name a few, have killed or maimed hundreds of millions of peoples over the years. But of course, like every story, there's another side to microbes. You see, it turns out that we coexist quite fine with most microbes. And it's a good thing, too, because microbes are everywhere. They're around us right now. They're on us. They're in us, sometimes in ways that you may not even know. Let me give you an example. If I go for a run after work to take my mind off of well, microbes, <laughs> the energy that's driving my body, that's fueling my body, is produced in a compartment in my muscle cells called mitochondria. Some of you have heard of mitochondria. But what you might not know is that mitochondria are, in fact, ancient vestigial microbes. They're bacteria engulfed and co-opted by our cells some billion plus years ago, repurposed, reprogrammed to generate energy for us. Microbes cohabitate our guts, they cohabitate our skin, they cohabitate our airway, and we use them to help digest our food, to train our immune systems, and even ensure optimal functioning of our brains. So another thing you may not know about microbes uh, that is obviously very important to me is, is their importance in the scientific enterprise. Okay, so in my lab here and in labs all around this atrium in the Cummings School of Medicine, we use microbes every day for our science experiments. We use strains of DNA to grow uh, copies, hundreds, millions of copies of DNA for our genetic experiments. We use HIV-like viruses that we've engineered to deliver this genetic material into cells and between cells for our biology experiments. And we use bits and pieces of bacterial immune systems that we've reverse engineered to cut and paste pieces of DNA into and out of cells for all of our cellular and animal experiments. The microbes have provided scientists like me with an experimental toolkit that was literally unimaginable 50 years ago and continues to boggle at least my mind um, today. And we're clever creatures too, us humans. And so we have uh, not only um, unwittingly devised strategies to harness the power of microbes, but we have, we have used microbes in, in, in other clever ways uh, besides scientific experimentation. Many of you are familiar with the use of yeast or fungi or bacteria uh, in the breads and in the cheeses and in the wines that we also enjoy and depend on in food production. You might not be aware that microbes are also being used, being developed, being studied uh, for uh, the bioremediation of polluted soils and airs and waters and for the genetic modification of foods crops and animals. So we use microbes in all sorts of, of interesting ways uh, to perform tasks that we deem important to us. So it seems to me as if a pattern has emerged. And that is whether we unwittingly have hijacked microbes, bacteria in particular, to generate our energy or to train our immune systems, or we have deliberately harnessed the power of microbes in food production, in pollution control, or in scientific inquiry, when faced with complex, difficult challenges, humans have turned to microbes for solutions. So that brings us to here and today. And the question, can microbes be used and the power of microbes be harnessed for precision medicine? So I'm not going to answer that question because that is a large, grand, ongoing experiment in thousands of labs and hospitals across the planet right now. But I am going to try and convince you of at least the power and potential of one type of microbe, the virus, 
in the precision treatment of cancer. And this is an area that we study in our lab upstairs and hope at some point to make some meaningful contributions towards uh, in the years to come. So viruses as a cancer therapy. Sounds scary, sound dangerous, <laughs> don't worry. So oncologists and cancer scientists have long turned to many of nature's most destructive uh, forces to treat cancer. Steel in the hands of a soldier kills, but in the hands of a surgeon uh, extracts tumors. Poisons in the hands of a general can annihilate, but in the hands of an oncologist can kill cancer cells. And radiation spewing from a nuclear meltdown can melt landscapes, but in the hands of a radiation oncologist melt away your tumor. So to me, it seems if history has taught us to turn to some of nature's most devastating forces to treat cancer, it's only fitting that going forward we turn to the greatest and most prolific killer of mankind, the microbe, the virus, as a new cancer therapy. Treating cancer with viruses is not a, a new idea. In fact, a century or so ago, clinicians had noticed that there were patients who showed up in their clinics with cancers that were incurable, who once contracted a virus infection, their cancers went away. And in fact, there were some, some famous examples. One was a, a woman in, in Italy whose cervical cancer, untreatable at the time, went into an eight-year remission after she'd received a live rabies vaccine for a dog bite. And there were other examples like this throughout the 20th, early part of the 20th century uh, that led clinicians and scientists to wonder whether viruses could someday be used as a potential treatment for cancer. But of course, this was the early 19th century. We didn't have the tools to be able to understand how this might work, and we certainly didn't have the methods and techniques to try and develop or engineer synthetic designer viruses as a precision medicine. In fact, throughout most of the 20th century, viruses were viewed by many as the culprit, the cause of cancer, not a potential treatment. Interestingly, in understanding or trying to understand how viruses could cause cancer, scientists actually discovered what cancer truly was, a disease of our, of our genes, of our genome, mutations within our genome that caused aberrant cell growth. And this critical insight actually provided the first clue as to how viruses might be able to be used to cure cancer. You see, viruses, some viruses, seemed to have, and now we know they have, a affinity for some of the mutations found in cancer cells. Now, some of you might not know how a virus works. Normally, what a virus does is it infects your cell, and it tries to grow in your cell, and the outcome of that interaction is often that the cell dies. So cells, normal cells, have evolved over the years, and this has been a long-standing evolutionary battle, have evolved many mechanisms to try and fight off a virus, to try and clear a virus so that it can survive. Well, it turns out Many of the genes that are mutated in a cancer are the same genes that the normal cell had evolved to try and protect itself from a virus infection. So those cancer cells, if they have those defects, they provided a little bit of a, of a niche inside of a patient for certain viruses to grow, to thrive, and to kill. There's tremendous biodiversity in, in viruses. There's thousands of them. And we've since learned that there are thousands and thousands of mutations that are also found in many people's cancers. So that gets you to wonder, from a personalized or precision medicine perspective, could, could we one day be treating cancer by matching a particular virus with certain properties with a particular cancer having other properties so that the virus has a propensity to infect that particular cancer? Now, the second thing that we've learned about viruses and their potential to kill cancer cells is that in addition to being able to directly kill cancer cells, viruses do another thing, or they can do another thing, and science has shown that, that they can sometimes help a patient's immune system attack and kill their own cancer. And your immune system, of course, is your, is your defense system, your T cells, your B cells, your antibodies. Uh, these things are constantly surveilling your blood and your tissues, looking out for things that are different, different from you. These are usually microbes, and protecting you in a world full of, full of germs, full of bugs. Scientists have learned something else about our immune system, which has been really important for cancer, and that is your immune system can also, uh, and is also, constantly surveilling you for rogue cells, cancer cells. And these cancer cells, they're not foreign like a bacteria or a virus. Cancer does come from you, but they're different. 
And they're different enough that your immune system can often view them as being altered. And when your immune system sees and recognizes an altered cell, it tries to kill it. And cancer cells, to become a cancer in a patient, need to develop strategies to try and either hide from your immune system or to prevent the immune system from attacking and killing it. And all successful cancers do just that. And interestingly, that fundamental discovery or understanding of, of cancer as an immune disorder has led to what I think is probably the most significant advance in cancer therapy in the last 50 years. And that is the, the development of immunotherapies, uh, antibodies, drugs, genetically engineered cells, all delivered to a patient with a unified goal. Help the patient's immune system learn their cancer, attack their cancer, kill their cancer. Treat the immune system and let the immune system treat the cancer. So a few years back, I was doing postdoctoral work in a lab uh, at the Children's Hospital in Ottawa. And we were working on a virus that had been isolated from a sand fly from the Maraba region of Brazil. And we had engineered genetically that virus to selectively infect cancer cells based on defects found within many cancer cells. And when we began to study that virus and how it worked at treating cancer inside of a live mouse, we noticed something really interesting. We noticed that although the virus would infect and kill the cancer cells, when it did that, the mouse's immune system in turn would also start to attack and kill their cancer it appeared that, that the virus infection had actually awakened or alerted the mouse's immune system to the fact that there was a cancer growing inside. And many colleagues of ours over the years have noted similar observations with other viruses. And in fact, this has now been observed in cancer patients treated with viruses uh, in the clinics. And, and what it's done, the, the understanding or the newfound understanding that viruses can lead to immune-based responses has raised a number of interesting and really important questions for our field. How does a virus cause a patient's immune system to recognize and kill their cancer? Which viruses do it best? How does the cancer fight back? Uh, can we combine with these viruses other immunotherapies that ultimately lead to better, stronger immune responses toward the cancer? Can we predict which patients will or will not respond to the cancer? So these are the types of questions that inspire and drive the research program in my lab here at the Cummings School of Medicine, and for which we hope to develop some answers toward over the course of the next, uh, over the next decade or so. I'm going to tell you one more thing. I'm going to tell you ultimately why, personally, I'm so excited about viral immunotherapy as a form of cancer therapy. And it's because we can engineer viruses. Viruses are platforms. They're modular. We can build off of them. And this is very different than any other cancer therapy almost any other cancer therapy. I liken these viruses to little programmable biological nanomachines. We can, using genetic engineering tools, insert in genes into our viruses, which impart new properties and new, and new functions onto our viruses. And the reason that this is so important, in particular in the context of our, our discussion about pre precision medicine tonight, is, is that it really opens the doors to truly personalized cancer medicines. So the idea that in the laboratory I could engineer, or my lab could engineer a virus uh, that could orchestrate an immune response inside of a cancer patient uniquely tailored towards the specific features of that patient's cancer. Personalized precision virotherapy. So how might this look? Well, imagine a, a, a child with osteosarcoma, which is still a devastating cancer uh, that has killed many uh, and claimed the life of Terry Fox, uh, walks into an oncology clinic a decade from now. A piece of their tumor is taken, some of their blood is drawn, and very quickly, the entire mutational spectrum of their cancer is determined using the sequencing technology. The, the nuances of their immune system and their immune cells are determined. The relationship between their immune system and their cancer is identified. And all of that information, in turn, is used not only to determine which virus that we're going to build off, but also exactly how to build, which genes to insert inside of this virus so that we can ultimately elicit a maximal 
personal response towards a very personal disease and a personalized disease, precision medicine for cancer. I'm going to take one step back here. Um, so smallpox and rabies virus and polio viruses, for centuries, these and other viruses were human scourges. And now these or very closely related viruses are being engineered, developed, and studied as cancer therapies. And in my opinion, these and other immunotherapies represent the greatest hope at curing or treating some of the cancers we have so far been unable to treat. But these types of medicines also raise new questions and new debates. Can we afford them, especially if they're highly personalized? How do we conduct a clinical trial if every patient gets a different medicine? Will there be unforeseeable long-term consequences to engaging a strong re immune reaction toward a cancer? This, of course, is all part of a large, grand, ongoing experiment. So viral therapy, of course, is, is it's a, it's a character, it's a player in a larger story. And that is a, a story of our evolving view of microbes. What we used to think of yesterday as, as plague, we think of today as possibility. Microbes developed for rare genetic diseases. Microbes developed for immune disorders. Microbes developed and engineered for gastrointestinal diseases. The possibilities are, are truly endless. And to me, this is fascinating because in ways it's, it, it's a bit of, I don't know, it's, it's ironic. It's a bit of restorative justice, I, the way I think of it, uh, in that you know, for so long these microbes have caused so much harm and devastation and death on us. And now we are on the cusp to really transforming them into our personal health care providers. So will we succeed as we march down this road? Time will tell, but I will tell you this that myself and many other scientists here and all around the globe are extraordinarily excited about the prospects and possibilities of harnessing the power of microbes to treat human disease. Thank you.